First of all, there isn't any question that for inter internal security reasons, we're going to have to have uh, equal opportunity. There's absolutely no question about that. All you have to do is to begin to uh, look at the kind of alienation uh, that prevails in too many of our centers today, to look at uh, situ uh, riots, uh, to look at various conflict situations, and the great movement towards separatism in too many of our ghetto communities to realize that if uh, we're actually going to remain a viable society, that it's going to be necessary for us for internal purposes to actually come up with uh, equal opportunity. We're going to have to do something to see to it that every individual, whether they be black, brown, or white, can exist in our society with dignity and without all forms of degradation. And I, I think that um, uh, this is one of the things that we're going to have to spend a great deal of time, uh, more time working on. I'm certain that I don't need to spend a great deal of time talking to you about the fact that for economic reasons we're going to have to have uh, equal opportunity. Uh, we're either going to have to have individuals uh, participating in society uh, as positive members, as contributors, as taxpayers, rather than dependents. We're going to pay for it one way or another, and it seems to me that the best way to do it is in terms of individuals really uh, carrying their own. And I, I think that we can never lose sight of the fact that if we really firmly believe that our way of life is the, the right way of life, the way of life that uh, we defend in all parts of the world, we're going to have to begin to close up uh, the gap between our promises and our performance. That is, if we want to continue to be a world leader. And as I see it, those are the three major reasons why we're going to have to have uh, equal opportunity. When um, the Kerner Commission came out with its report, there was a great deal of uh, uh, reaction to this. The militant black people thought the report was good, and the only reason many of them thought it was good is they called white people racist. Uh, many white people reacted to the report because they didn't like to be called racist. Everyone uh, really, when they look at the term racism, they look at it from the standpoint of whether or not they are prejudice, whether or not uh, they have discriminatory attitudes against other individuals. And right away, anytime someone indicts us as an in individual, we react. And um, I, I think that um, not enough people really looked at what the Kerner Commission was saying when they said that there is racism, that the basic problem in America today is racism. What do we mean by racism? Uh, as I see it, they were not talking about necessarily an individual's attitudes. The thing that they were really talking about is the fact that in America today, we have, in essence, a system which, to a very great extent, results in the subordination of an individual because of the color of their skin, uh, their national origin, or their background. In other words, racism, as I see it, what they were really talking about was institutional racism, a system of subordination um, based on an individual's color, national origin, uh, race, background. Now, what are, the, what are the forms? How does racism manifest itself? What are the forms of racism? All of us uh, know about overt racism. We can talk about uh, discrimination in employment. We can talk about the kind of discrimination that prevails in the South and vo voting. We can talk about discrimination in, in housing. This is the kind of racism that uh, most people think that we're talking about. But as I see it, there's another form of racism. Now, since uh, uh, most of you are architects or planners, you know what I'm really getting at. One of the things uh, that we're very concerned about relates to this whole area of zoning. As you know, in this country today, the Congress has said that during the next 10 years, we shall build 26 million housing units, 6 million of which shall be for low and moderate income people. Now, in order to do this, this is going to mean 600,000 uh, low income units built each year. 
Now, you and I both know that uh, if, if you really, even if you wanted to, you couldn't build six million housing units in the central city. Many of these housing units are going to have to be built in suburban communities. But in too many communities, the way that they're zoned, there isn't any question that right now, you know that there are not going to be any black people in those communities, or there are not going to be very many poor people because of the fact that the restrictions against, uh, uh, for example, high-rise housing, against um, uh, 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 certain kinds of uh, modular housing. Uh, there's a study currently underway by the National Committee Against Discrimination in Housing in six counties in the New York metropolitan area. Uh, for example, they've been looking at Westchester County, New York, and found that of the, of the land that is available for, resident, uh, for housing construction, over 70% of it that is available is in terms of one half, half acre lots. Now, there isn't any question about what the net effect of that kind of law, that kind of ordinance is. Now, I'm certain that uh, you would say that the people who were responsible for these ordinances, did not uh, sit down and consciously decide that they were going to dis discriminate against individuals. But it has the same effect as, as though they set out to, to consciously uh, discriminate against individuals. I can say the same thing in, in terms of um, some of our other plans uh, for, for land use. Uh, for example, um, uh, how uh, an area is planned in terms of land use may determine whether or not the FHA, the federal government, is actually going to insure mortgages. Um, if, um, if the community has planned the, the land for primarily for industrial purposes, there isn't any question that it isn't going to be possible uh, for FHA uh, to uh, insure mortgages. So I think that uh, as we uh, look ahead in terms of zoning as we uh, look at problems relating to land use. We're going to have to be more conscious, we're going to have to be more color conscious than we have in the past in terms of what are the net effect of these practices on the opportunities of individuals. Uh, there are other practices which are sacred, for example, in the area of employment, which have an adverse effect um, on uh, the upward mobility of minority groups. And many of these practices have no meaningful use today, but it's a traditional kind of thing that, that we followed and we continue along with them. Uh, for example, uh, we see all over this nation now extensive use of tests uh, for individuals for uh, industrial type employment. Uh, we find that there's too little uh, validation of these tests to determine whether or not these tests uh, are actually uh, testing for the skills or the insights that is going to make it possible for an individual to perform the job more effectively. Well, you, when you ask someone why they're doing it, well, we've always done it and we think tests are important. They don't stop to think, they don't stop to look at these tests to determine whether or not the net effect of these tests is that they uh, end up uh, uh, really having an adverse effect on uh, many minority group individuals. These are the kind of things that I think we're going to have to look more critically at than we uh, have in the past. The old standard of living materialistic index measurement is no longer enough. We're wealthy enough as a nation. There are still groups in our society, unfortunately, that don't share that wealth, and that is another major national problem. But from this point on, because a couple of months ago or weeks ago, our gross national product, product passed the annual rate of $900 billion. And in terms of the functioning of our economy and our wealth, we seem to have even solved the, the business cycle. We're a, a very wealthy and very rich and very powerful and very talented country. But there's no question at all but that the result of all this has been a, a disproportionate national problem and uh, that, that, our, that the results need to be called in question. There's no doubt that uh, we're a very prosper, prosperous people, but the events that we read about every day 
on the front pages of our newspaper say that there's trouble with regard to the prosperity of the human spirit in this country. And they say to us that there is a questioning of the performance of our institutions and of our treatment of human beings. And I, I believe this is a very healthy thing if we treat it as an opportunity to have a very great and unparalleled debate about our future. Now, I was told before I came and I read up a bit that one of the things that concerns Iowa is that you're one of the slowest growing states and that you, uh, you, you, uh, that, that this bothers you and I want to soothe you on this point. I'm going to soothe you and challenge you in the next breath, however. I happened to be in Vermont with Senator George Aiken, one of the great men of the Congress, not long after the 1960 census. And, and Vermont was one of, I think, two or three states that between 1950 and 1960 not only didn't grow, it lost population. And a reporter asked the senator a very penetrating question. He said, Senator, the census results have just been announced, and Vermont has, has uh, as one of the few states that lost population, does this disturb you? Well, it didn't disturb Aiken at all, and he looked him right in the eye and he said, well, he said, some of us in Vermont, we sit and we look around us in these other states in the country and see what they call growth. He said, we're not disturbed, we're gonna wait and grow right. And it seems to me that uh, those states that have not grown so rapidly, that they have piled up on their doorsteps enormous, perhaps insoluble problems in the short run, uh, should be congratulated at this time. There are great urban complexes today, my friends, that are sick, that suffer from degenerative diseases. I don't know, and I'll get more specific, whether New York is a dying city or whether you can do anything about improving the environment of the Los Angeles region to get even more specific, but I, I am saying to you that uh, we have, as a result of this imbalance in our national progress and our national performance, created enormous problems where most of the people live. And that the solving of these problems is the work of two or three decades. And that part of the solution of that problem depends upon the viability and the creativity in other parts of our country. Uh, because it means that you have a greater opportunity. You don't have as many problems. It isn't nearly as costly for you to undo the spoiling damage that uh, besets and uh, harasses most of the American cities today. Because I, I deeply believe from everything that I see, and I've been uh, deliberately getting around to campuses all over this country and speaking the last three months. Keeps you on your toes, Alan. And I believe we are seeing a long overdue questioning of basic values in this country. It's not alone the, the young, it's sensitive people conservationists, architects, designers, businessmen, some of them, who are increasingly asking the question whether our national priorities and national goals are not out of whack. And I think the ferment on the campuses and in the country is part of this questioning of our failures of the past, of institutions that don't solve problems, and, uh, and is uh, in essence saying we're we're, we're aiming too low, and that we should aim much higher. And yet, <clears throat> when we look at how we spend our national wealth, and of, of course our private affluence and what we have inside our homes and the vehicles that we move about in, we're so uh, beguiled as a people with speed, with movement. I think perhaps the most penetrating comment made in recent years on American travel, because travel depends upon the eye and what the eye discovers and on what man learns. And we move so much and so fast that we're not interested 
are less and less interested. And Frank Dolby, the Texas writer, said in his last years, he said, we don't travel anymore, we're just transported. And when I think of, uh, I happen to like this uh, generation of jet aircraft because you have a magnificent view of this continent if you like geography and you can settle down and maybe write something or read something. And the SST we're, that we're moving towards, we're proposing to spend several billions of dollars to produce it. It'll put you in a tube and get you there in two hours. And uh, in terms of the past American progress, this is what we're for. Faster is always better. Bigger is always better. Rather than having better be what is more human. And I recall the last week of the late unlamented administration at our last cabinet meeting when uh, the president went around the table see if anybody had any last comments and being one of the three members of the cabinet who had been there for eight years I decided to say something and the thing that I said was that when I looked at this country and its total environment and I was not reflecting what I thought had happened in my own area because this concerned the work of the new HUD department, the transportation department, agriculture, so many others, that I was not at all sure that the thing that we would look back upon, that was most important that we achieve, was not a piece of legislation, was not a bill, a program, or the, the money or lack of money in programs, but that we had successfully orchestrated what was happening in the country, which was a change of the basic attitude and outlook of the American people with regard to their environment. And I pointed out uh, as proof of this, the difficulty that uh, the man proposed as my successor was then having with the Congress and, and that somebody could have said what he said. And unfortunately, he, there are code words in conservation as well as civil rights. He used the wrong words without knowing what he was saying. But someone 10 years ago could have said the same things, and there would have been a few criticisms from the fringe. But uh, he, when he said them this time, it caused a national furor, and uh, I suspect already it's had a rather chastening influence on him and on his conduct. Uh, so that uh, there is a, a growing groundswell I think if there wasn't in this state and this region, you wouldn't be having a conference of this kind. I not only commend you for the scope of the conference, because I think it's, it's foolish for my conservationist friends to get off by themselves and discuss a little piece of the natural environmental problem without having the others there, because everything is interlinked, the works of man, the works of nature, it's all one battle for one environment. And uh, recognition of that fact was part of this new awareness of the 1960s. 